This engine will soon fly at Mach 5. That's over 3,000 miles per hour. But the company that built it was on the brink of failure just a few years ago. Now, they're closer than ever to getting this hypersonic plane off the ground. This technology will change how goods and people move around the planet. It effectively makes the world regional. New York to Paris in 90 minutes. LA to Tokyo in about three hours. If it works, it will change the landscape of both civilian and military aviation forever. And the craziest part is that this technology already works. We've been able to fly faster than the speed of sound for decades. So why aren't all our planes hypersonic already? What are the keys to unlocking high-speed travel for real this time? The realities of physics and economics have always gotten in the way, but this startup wants to solve this problem for good. This is the story of Hermius. A.J. Piplica loved aircraft from a young age. Specifically, he loved the idea of aircraft being used to transport people. Loved the future. Like, I was a huge you know, sci-fi fan, Star Trek and Star Wars. We are here only to help guide you into a new era. A thing that like always stuck for me from just those universes that, that people imagine was like, transportation is such a major plot point that nobody even thinks about. It's like, oh, well, we got these spaceships that just fly all over the universe. It's like, okay, what's like the closest thing to that in the world that we have today? It's like, well, airplanes, rockets, space stuff. And I go find a book about, you know, spacecraft, space probes and whatnot. I'm like, well, this uh, looks Nothing like the Star Trek thing, but still pretty cool. After he graduated high school, he went to study aerospace engineering at Georgia Tech. I really didn't know like what aerospace engineering actually was. I knew it's like, okay, it's about airplanes, right? As a grad student, he worked at the NASA Johnson Space Center in Houston. As an aerodynamicist in space, is it much that you can do? Because it's a vacuum, right? So it's like rocket engines or re-entry. And I ended up on the re-entry side, and that's how I kind of fell into the hypersonics world. AJ knew he wanted to do something historic, but he still needed to find that first opportunity. And I got an email from Georgia Tech saying, Bill Nye, the science guy, is coming to talk. And I'm like, Mom, Dad, I need you to go and get his autograph for me. So they went to this thing, got his autograph, and uh, the CEO of Spaceworks was like standing there next to him, and my parents started talking to him, and it came back to me later and was like, hey, you should talk to this guy. So I just sent him a cold email and was like, hey, like, I'd love to learn a little bit about what you do. I'm interested in not just engineering, I'm interested in business. And that conversation turned into a summer internship that turned into a year-long internship that turned into two years of part-time work during grad school into a full-time job and eventually into leading a subsidiary of that company. That company, Generation Orbit, was in the hypersonics business. In August of 2015, Generation Orbit received a U.S. government grant to develop the world's first commercially available hypersonic testbed. That gave AJ more runway, which he used to hire more staff. Hired Glenn. Glenn came from Blue Origins. I was thinking, what, there's a rocket company in Atlanta? That's crazy. So I reached out and said, hey, I know this is a cold call, but love to talk. And I eventually just convinced them to give me a job. Hired Skyler. I just finished up uh, college and internships at the SpaceX. It was full time, really just AJ, Glenn, and myself for a few months. And then a couple years later, hired Mike. The dissertation that he wrote for his PhD was very close to what we were doing. AJ reached out on LinkedIn. Their public profile was more on small satellite launch, kind of combining a lot of the rocket stuff I've been doing at SpaceX with my love of hypersonics. So we worked together for about three years, bleeding in the trenches, making stuff happen. Mike ran systems engineering, Glenn ran propulsion structures, and Skyler ran avionics and software. The four guys quickly realized that they all shared a dream, to build a hypersonic plane. Now, in order to understand Hermius, we have to get sharp about a few key concepts. So I called up Alex Hollings to explain. Hypersonic is a word that we usually use to describe objects that are traveling fast enough for their speed to actually affect the chemical makeup of the air that they interact with. And it tends to happen at around Mach 5. And because of that, we use Mach 5 as sort of that baseline for what we consider to be hypersonic speed, but it's not like a physical barrier. It's more just like a concept. Okay, so at this point, AJ and his team had broken into the aerospace industry. They were building cool stuff and getting paid to do it, but they wanted to go bigger. Hypersonic aircraft already existed. The X-15 reached the edge of outer space in the 1960s, and the U.S. Air Force awarded Boeing a contract to build the X-20, a rocket-powered space plane. But none had ever carried civilian passengers before. They knew this technology was ready for prime time. 
you could build a Mach 5 reusable vehicle with today's technology if you frame the problem correctly. But in order to build it, they would need to branch out on their own. And that's really what it took to you know, take the leap and say like, okay, we see something much greater than what we're doing here. We're gonna quit our relatively good paying jobs like, and we're gonna leave and go start from scratch. We basically decided, you know, as AJ usually likes to say, jump off a cliff and build an airplane on the way down. AJ, Glenn, Skyler, and Mike gave themselves six months to turn their idea into a business. We knew we wanted to build a prototype engine. You know, we had a rough idea of how much it would cost us to do that, how long it would take us to do that. Pseudo competitors, I guess, they're really focused on other different technologies that enable high speed, um, but don't use the same sort of fuels and things that are readily available at like airports. And really from there, it's, you know, what are existing technologies that we can plug together in an interesting way. So we have this like very general vision for what the long term is. Okay, like how do we get there? What's the roadmap? And then like, what are the right incremental steps to take? from a technology perspective to get to that roadmap? And then what are the right business steps to take so that the business is scaling alongside so we can actually raise money for this thing? These guys thought they had a solid business plan, so they applied to Y Combinator. We didn't come from the startup world. We didn't know how to raise venture capital. We didn't have a connections, like a network in venture capital world. So we're like, we just got to start with like the name brand and see what happens. Everybody comes into a, a pitch conversation around hypersonic airplanes with tons of opinions like, Concorde failed, why would this ever work? You're not Elon, how are you gonna do this? And like in five minutes, how do you get people educated enough and re and trained to like, <laughs> that was tough. There are a lot of venture capital firms that are not good fits to something like this for various reasons. Like, you know, building airplanes is a capital intensive thing and it's a very different CapEx profile than, than say a B2B software as a service company. YC was interested. They actually gave Hermes a second interview, which is really rare, but they ended up saying no. AJ and his co-founders were devastated. It looked like their dream was going to remain just a dream, but they decided to give it one last shot. In the beginning of 2019, we were making some really, really good progress with the firm to the point where like, we we're starting to have our first discussions about a term sheet. Like we made it further than we'd ever made it in the past. Something weird started happening and they started asking some pretty strange questions. Like, aren't you gonna give all the passengers concussions going that fast? And I'm like, you, you confuse acceleration and velocity, you know? Um, and they're like, well, what about all the fire? Like, that's what engines do. They make fire. We had put together a board of advisors. Um, so that was really good and validating. Yeah, you're like, you guys are on the right track. This is really interesting. Like, if you're successful, like you're doing something that's important. In the middle of that meeting, we're like heading to dinner and I check my email and it's a note from the firm that like was like very, very keen, very like moving forward. They're like, nah, we're out. And it's like, oh, and this is, starting to get close to that six month deadline. The pit of despair later that evening, right? Verge on tears, because what are we gonna do? We only got a month, how, how many more meetings can we have? Um, I'm running out of, you know, I'm starting to look for jobs at this point. They were about to throw in the towel and even took a personal day to clear their heads and come up with slightly less serious business ideas. So Mike and I went one way and we came up with this like, we're gonna import Hamon Iberico and start like Hamon carts and Glenn and Skyler went off and created this like hot tub on a limousine at night idea. That was like Thursday of this week. And then Friday, I get an email from Coastal Ventures saying, hey, we'd love for you to come in and talk to us about what you're doing. And it was like massive high, massive low, and then another massive high, um, all in the span of a week. Two weeks after that, they were in a meeting with Vinod Kosla himself. What's more, he understood that Hermes was trying to leverage existing technology, not create something entirely new. Most people attempting something like this are talking about multi-billion dollar engine design and a decade or more of huge uncertainty. Hermes is a very short path to proving the key risks out and then going to market in the national defense context. I think the money hit our bank account at like 7 p.m., 6, 7 p.m. on the last day of that six month clock. It was literally it, like as close as you could possibly cut it. With the money from their first funding round in the bank, it was officially time to start building this thing. Every tech company wrestles with the build versus buy trade-off, and this was a particularly hard problem for Hermes. They wanted to build an entirely new kind of aircraft, but still had to rely on as many off-the-shelf parts as possible to reduce risk. 
To advance their concept, the team opted to modify an existing jet engine. We had to learn how to, you know, operate the jet engine first and then put our specific hardware on there. It was really just kind of pedal to the metal, doing everything ourselves, and then built the team up to about eight people. We showed in the seed round that we can take a commercial jet engine, pull off its afterburner, put our own afterburner on, and run it with way higher speeds than it's designed for. In October 2020, Hermius raised a $16 million Series A round. The company's next step was even bigger. Take the subscale engine that we did, build a full-scale version of it called Chimera. Chimera is what's called a turbine-based combined cycle engine, which means it's basically a hybrid between a turbojet and a ramjet. Let's break down the difference between a traditional jet engine and a ramjet. Your typical jet engine uses compressed air and fuel to generate high-velocity exhaust. It can increase power slowly to allow for takeoff and landing. Ramjets are different, though. They have no moving parts and instead rely on forward motion to compress air for combustion. This means that they need an external boost to start working, which is why they're usually launched from planes or rockets. Hermes combined these two technologies to allow the engine to take off from a standstill and then transition to ramjet power once the aircraft is traveling fast enough. So it's both a jet engine and a ramjet, hence the name Chimera. How we transition from a turbojet engine at low speed to a ramjet engine at high speed, uh, that's something that's never been done in flight. The team used modern manufacturing techniques like 3D printing to accelerate development, and it worked. They developed the Chimera engine in just over a year, but making the engine was only half the battle. Then they had to go prove that it worked. There's only one wind tunnel in the United States that I'm aware of that can support hypersonic speeds. It's a NASA wind tunnel. With hypersonic tests in the United States, we've done something like 22 in 10 years, and that's just not fast enough to be able to field this technology in the kind of volume that we want to field it. Startups are always a race against time, and the Hermes team had to move fast. We signed a contract with Notre Dame's Turbo Machinery Laboratory. So we ship it up there, start doing our testing up there. And Fortunately, the first test was a huge success and proved that the hybrid concept worked. Being able to show that was a pretty substantial de-risk and like, hey, this technology could work. So that unlocked the Series B with led by Sam Altman and with some participation from some other folks, Founders Fund. What Series B allowed us to do is really start putting the, you know, pushing the throttle forward for Quarter Horse. Quarter Horse is Hermius' first airplane. And while that prototype couldn't fly, there was a lot it could do. So what goal do we set in hydrosonics today? accelerating the global human transportation network. Our goal is to complete that challenge, to fly passengers across oceans at hypersonic speeds before this young decade is out. We were thinking, what's the most audacious thing that we could do, kind of unveil our product? What if we had an aircraft unveil, which everybody has an aircraft unveil, right? Usually it's a styrofoam model and you pull it away and then it's like, oh, congratulations, you made something pretty. Uh, we wanted to do more. We wanted to actually fire an engine in there. If everyone could please take the headsets, this is definitely something you're going to want to see and feel. I can't tell you how many trials and tribulations just that effort had with that video that everybody's seen of just like, oh wow, here's Quarter Horse. Wow, we're a little bit ahead of where you think we are. Their Quarter Horse prototype was a big achievement and it brought them a step closer to realizing their grand vision. But the journey toward a fully functional aircraft was still far from over. All of our first aircraft are remotely piloted. When they're remotely piloted, you know, that's a pretty well solved problem at this point. What is not as well solved is how fast we have to take off and land. So you can't have big wings. You want things that are low drag to be able to push that speed up and up and up. And that's really the opposite of what you want when you're landing. So being able to thread that needle is where we're kind of focused. But this is where things get a little tricky. The real challenge is building the machine that builds the machine. It's not enough to build one plane. They need to scale their operations so they can efficiently produce tons of these aircraft. Our initial tail of Quarter Horse is really the one where we're testing out the team coming together, working with the manufacturing team, integrate an engine, and really test every subsystem that we have and bring as many learnings as possible to the left. We can't lose sight that we need to build hardware. We need to go test it, we need to go fly it, and then iterate, and really change the way that we as a country are designing these types of aircraft. We've done that with rockets. 
We figured out how to do that, but we haven't done that yet with aircraft. Putting out a new aircraft on less than a year cadence, that's I think the level of iteration that's gonna be required to actually solve this problem. This rapid iteration is massively resource intensive, but turbocharges new development. Right now, the team sees Quarter Horse as mostly a prototype, but the next step is where they enter the big leagues. These renders are of Dark Horse, their next generation of hypersonic aircraft. Although the team has the goal of revolutionizing passenger travel, this aircraft has massive military potential. And this is where we need to talk about hypersonic weapons. Hypersonic weapons offer massive advantages in terms of speed and maneuverability. Because of the name, people always focus on how fast the weapons travel. But we've had ICBMs for decades, and those re-enter the atmosphere at hypersonic speeds. What's crucial about hypersonic weapons is that they can fly closer to the Earth. This means they hide below the horizon, reducing the time before radar can detect them and making them much harder to shoot down. And America's two biggest rivals are investing heavily in hypersonic technology. China is fielding hypersonic anti-ship weapons that they want to use to prevent American aircraft carriers primarily from being able to come within a thousand miles of Chinese shores. It's an area defense approach. Russia is trying to maintain their role as the second largest arms supplier in the world. And a big part of that is advancing the narrative of having very modern weapons that people will want to pay top dollar for. The United States and lots of other countries have developed air launched ballistic missiles, but they don't use them because there's no way as a defender to discern between an inbound ballistic missile with a nuclear warhead on board and one without. I think the first application we'd see for a platform like Dark Horse at Hermius would be ISR, Intelligence, Surveillance, and Reconnaissance. There's kind of two key attributes to Dark Horse. Number one is responsiveness, which is flying very fast over long distances. And in the Pacific theater, that's what that theater is characterized by, long distances. And then the other piece is taking action in contested environments. So like, can you be survivable enough to not get shot down? The United States and most other well-developed militaries in the world are trying to network everything. That's where hypersonic aircraft could either fill that role or they could rapidly deploy communications nodes. Reusable hypersonic aircraft would end the hypersonic arms race. Winning this arms race wouldn't stop China and Russia from continuing to invest in their own military capability, but it would provide the U.S. and its allies with a strong deterrent. And deterrence is the best tool we have to prevent wars from breaking out. Hermes had proved the feasibility of their core technology, but at the same time, they were edging closer to the Valley of Death. Valley of Death, it's like the period of time from after you got a prototype or a demonstration before you get production. And you know, it's called the Valley of Death because that's sort of that window where most companies die. It's that two to three year spot where the department is kind of chipping through their internal government processes. You know, companies need to continue to show revenue and growth and most companies can't afford to kind of chip through that valley of death. Every defense tech company needs to find a way to get through the valley of death. Anduril was a great example of how to solve that problem, but not all defense tech companies make it through. So you have to phase your milestones correctly and you have to get the customer to build a bridge across that like valley of death with a longer term contract. Even if it's, if it's not a procurement contract, an R&D contract, that's of a large enough scale to like fund the company, keep it going and use venture capital to fund growth. AJ and his co-founders started Hermius because they believed that the technology was ready, that they could attract private capital, and that the US government might invest in hypersonics. If Hermius was going to cross the valley of death, all those things had to come true. When you're doing this really hard deep tech problem, you can't just go straight to the finish line and try and build the hypersonic aircraft that has ISR capabilities and weapons on board and can defeat China. Like, like that's way too tall of an order. There's just too many unknowns. It's too, too capital intensive and there's way too much risk. So instead, they basically raise money and then they build an engine, then they go and test it, and then they get a contract with government which proves revenue or like demand, and then they go and raise more. So their first contract, I believe, was to evaluate the viability of a hypersonic Air Force One. There was no way that they were gonna promise to build a hypersonic Air Force One, but the fact that they were still able to get a contract and actually get some response from the government and get some get some you know buy-in that, hey, we will actually give you money, there's now revenue on the books, just to deliver kind of just a report and some data. So if you come in with an idea, you have a higher burden to prove the utility of that. So a lot of what we're doing right now is like 
tell a story to the department. It's like, hey, even if I don't deliver an aircraft at the end of the day, if I study and mature these subsets of technologies, you're still getting your money's worth because these are problems that America needs to solve. So getting that on contract has a huge benefit for us of like having stable revenue, getting real buy-in from the department, and then like the ability to anchor milestones with the government to build that confidence and comfort so that we can go build the mission the mission critical vehicle. But in order to do that, and this is one of the conversations we have with the government is like, you guys have to continue to show up as we succeed so that we can ask more of our investors. The end goal is to win what's called a program of record. This is when the government has allocated ongoing funding across many years to really put a new piece of technology into use. Hypersonic aircraft is such a novel concept for the DoD that there isn't anybody who owns it. And so now we're like even just trying to help the department think about who should own this. Because before you get to a program of record, you need to have somebody to own it, feed it, care for it, advocate for it. So there's all these sort of like sub steps of dealing with the world's largest bureaucracy that come well before a program of record. I certainly want to get us to a program of record. That's our end all be all. Even if you build the world's greatest piece of technology, that in and of itself doesn't guarantee you anything. The surface area that you have to cover to make a sale of like a multi-hundred million dollar contract to the DOD is massive. You have to work with the end users, the warfighters, because they're the ones that send the demand signal. So you need them on board. Then you need the acquisition community on board. The folks who are actually gonna make the money decisions of like, all right, are we gonna prioritize this or this? And then you need Congress on board. They're the final say on the budget. Like, yes, the Air Force gets to say what they want and the president gets to say what, what he or she wants, but Congress is the final say on what, what actually gets funded. It's something that very few companies and very few people have done successfully. As far as like venture back companies that have done it, the only ones that have done it have had billionaire founders that have been able to like give the company enough runway and time to be successful in, in getting to a large scale um, defense program. There's a tension between the Department of Defense and industry on where did that idea originate? An idea that comes from the outside in is going to get treated far more hostily than an idea that comes from the inside out. And if you think about the term defense contractor, that's because historically the defense department contracted somebody to build them something. So they, they were the expert on what was needed. When you're a defense program, it's really important to have public support. Otherwise you end up like the B-1 bomber in 1977, where the public was asking, why are we doing this? And that ended up canceling the program. So if you can get the public excited, then it's a lot easier to get the, the defense department to pay you. AJ and his co-founders had come a long way from trying to import Hamon Iberico, but there was still so much farther to go. Seeing this resurgence of interest in hypersonics at the defense level, and I think that is more driven by some geopolitical events where, hey, like now there's this re-interest in hypersonics, that's really unlocking the type of technology that we want to be developing that serves a great purpose on the defense side, but also kind of leads into like what that commercial vision is. After Dark Horse, Hermius is planning to build Halcyon, a commercial aircraft that can fly 20 people from New York to Paris in 90 minutes. How airlines differentiate their products is through comfort and luxury. There are way better ways to spend extra resources that are going to those things that can produce more for a broader scope of people. And that comes down to speed. Halcyon has the potential to transform travel, trade, and diplomacy. And if it did, then it would totally transform the way we live our lives. Well, we talk about using resources instead of for comfort uh, to put them towards speed and in this time. And when you do that at a global scale, you unlock that latent potential of humanity in both the social and an economic sense. In an economic sense, we speed up the world by 5x. That will drive global GDP growth 2.5% a year. That's $4 trillion a year. AJ Piplica and his co-founders started Hermes because they wanted to create the biggest paradigm shift in aviation for more than 50 years. Hypersonic missiles very likely won't change the world. Hypersonic aviation very likely will. In order for their dream to become a reality, three things needed to come true. The technology needed to be feasible, they had to attract private capital, and they had to successfully sell the US government to avoid the valley of death. And in the process, they might just have given the US and its allies a big advantage in the hypersonic arms race. So far, they've succeeded, but there's still a long way to go. There's a question that comes up more often than any other. Why are you doing this? Why did you choose to do this versus anything else that you could do? The answer to that question is the massive impact that not just this technology, but the products and services that come after it, the defense applications that can help prevent a large scale geopolitical conflict these things will have a massive, sustainable, positive impact 
not just on the people in this room, but for the entire human race. And there are not many things that you can spend your time doing that you can say that about. To learn about another company that's using advanced technology to help the United States restore the global balance of power, just watch this video next. Thanks a lot.